Specific Chronology of the Seven Days of Human History The construction of a biblical chronology of human history thus runs into two profound problems. One, hermeneutic. Two, practical. The second problem, or really set of problems, is concerned with analysing the biblical data and applying it to the timeline of human history. The first problem, the hermeneutic or interpretive problem, is really a question of whether such an attempt is profitable, practical and scriptural in the first place. This question is all the more delicate inasmuch as certain scriptures, Matthew 24, 36, Mark 13, 32 and Acts 1, 7 in particular, are commonly used by contemporary exegetes to discourage such attempts, a disposition which is certainly understandable in light of so many recent attempts to predict the end times in clearly misguided ways. Certainly prophecy is a gift not presently active in the church. Interpretation of Scripture, however, is another matter, and it must be underlined at this point that the projection of the seven millennial day interpretation so as to arrive at, among other things, the probable commencement of the tribulation is an application of Scripture, not a prediction. Readers are encouraged to examine the analysis upon which the theory which underlies this projection is based and form their own conclusions. It has always been and will ever be the guiding principle of this ministry to discover the truth of Scripture and delineate it as perspicuously as possible, withholding none of the counsel of God, Acts 20.20 20, 20 and 20.27. 20, Look at the fig tree in all its leaves. When they have already come out like this, you can see for yourselves by examining it that summer is near. So also when you see that all things of verses 5 through 28 have come to pass, Know that the kingdom of God is near. Luke 21, 29 through 31 As we are to watch events in preparation for the trying times to come, so also we ought to make use of whatever specific chronological guidance the Scriptures offer us, for it is certainly there for a reason. When we accept this principle, the issue becomes one of accuracy in interpretation. The most potentially controversial piece of information, that is, the projected date for the commencement of the tribulation, is based upon the following suppositions, all of which are treated within the context of this study. The seven millennial day interpretation is taught in Scripture and meant to be understood and applied. The church age will last for two millennial days or two thousand years. The church age commenced following the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ. These events took place in 33 AD. The tribulation belongs to both the church and Jewish ages and is therefore to be subtracted from the 2,000-year total when calculating the start of the tribulation. The half-hour of silence in heaven at the breaking of the seventh seal, Revelation 8.1, signifies a half-year grace period that shifts the start point from spring to fall. Scripture gives no indication of either shortening or lengthening of this timeline, and therefore no such change of schedule is anticipated. These points are all presented here as true, and the analysis upon which they are based is set forth in this discussion. Clearly, deviation from any of this will alter the entire scheme. It is also true, as we have already said, that alteration of the schema to be presented is certainly within the power and authority of the Almighty. The very end of the tribulation, for example, will be shortened by some undisclosed amount of time, Mark 13.20. Rather than undermining the theory advanced in this study, however, Mark 13.20 in actuality supports the importance of paying heed to the Bible's chronological information. For if the days are shortened, then surely this means that there was a definite heavenly timetable in the first place. Secondly, Mark 13.20 indicates that the shortening mentioned is a matter of days, weeks at the most, that is, not enough to change the general timeline given. This is certainly in line with the very specific tally of days and months given in Daniel and Revelation. From the practical point of view as well, the difficulties of constructing a precise chronology of the seven millennial days are significant. Anyone who has ever delved into ancient chronological issues and especially into biblical chronology, will have an idea of the significant problems involved in so doing. Working from the millennial day hypothesis, however, it is possible to construct a fairly solid chronology, and the task, though challenging, is by no means without purpose, 
if for no other reason than that we who live in the shadow of the approaching tribulation are well served by having a general idea of its proximity. With these thoughts in mind, the present schema is offered. The Life of Christ We begin with the most significant period in the history of the world, the life of our Saviour Jesus Christ. Scripture calls this time the conjunction of the ages, Hebrews 9.26, and so it is, for his birth marks the postponement of the Jewish age, while his death, resurrection and ascension to heaven signal the imminent commencement of the church age, Acts 1, 4 and 5. It is therefore from this point that our investigation of the specific chronology of the seven millennial days must commence. The Birth of Christ To begin with, we know from Luke 3 one that John began baptizing during the 15th imperial year of Tiberius, that is, from August 19th of A.D. 28 to August 18th of A.D. 29. Since Luke states that Jesus was about 30 at the commencement of his public ministry, Luke 3.23, an event that post-dates the time when John began baptizing, there can be little doubt that the birth of Christ is to be fixed circa 1-2 B.C. To place Christ's birthday any earlier would make him twenty-something, not about thirty. Moreover, this phrase is best taken, and arguably can only be properly taken, especially given Luke's penchant for precision. Compare the precise dating of John's ministry at Luke 3.23 to mean that while Christ had not yet reached his thirtieth birthday, he was very close to doing so, that is, he was twenty-nine and set to turn thirty that same calendar year. If we accept December as Christ's birth month, therefore, he will then have been born in 2 BC, only one year earlier than supposed by the Christocentric calendar we now use, established by Dionysius Exiguus circa 525 AD at the behest of Pope John I. It is impossible within the scope of this study to detail all of the chronological details and arguments connected with Christ's birth, but the 2 BC date in addition to being based on the only two clear chronological references in the Gospel, that is, Luke 3, 1 and 3, 23, is also recommended by three other important factors. First, it allows for a three-year ministry of Christ, as required by the chronological details of John's Gospel, as we shall see when discussing the date of the crucifixion. Secondly, it allows for a crucifixion date of 33 A.D., by far the most likely date when independently derived. And thirdly, it squares most precisely with the universal census mentioned by Luke, Luke 2, 1 through 3. The census. The first two points that need to be clarified here are that the universal census described in Luke 2, 1 through 3, is not the census of Quirinius, and secondly, that Luke does not in fact equate the two. That Quirinius, Roman governor of Syria from circa A.D. 6 to 11, held a census in A.D. 6, 7 is well established. Compare the writing Josephus. It is therefore unfortunate that English versions of the Bible inevitably mistranslate Luke's Greek to make these two separate censuses appear to be one and the same. Properly translated, Luke 2, 2 states that this was a census which occurred prior to Quirinius's governorship of Syria.